स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Like this, 
And please remember, this landscape was painted at least uh, 150 or 200 years before the invention of camera. But this kind of oil paintings can actually replicate nature, represent nature so vividly, so realistically, that it could be considered and accepted as a convincing, appropriate, and absolutely reliable visual representation of nature. So obviously, this kind of art prospered to a great extent. People love to have this kind of artworks at their homes. Rich people commissioned artists to do this kind of artworks for them. So this was by and large the language of art that dominated the entire Europe for a long, long time since late 15th and early 16th century. So along with the rendering of realistic light and state, which is known as, technically speaking, chiaroscuro, art of the past since Renaissance developed a highly skilled technique of perspective. Now, this application of perspective, a theory of perspective, is going to be uttered later by the modern artists. Say, for example, somebody like Picasso would reverse the whole idea of perspective and come up with a radical idea called cubism. We'll come to that later. Now, this technique of perspective made the paintings in the traditional Western art, look even more convincing. And the paintings became very, very realistic in its appearance and also illusionistic. Continuously, these kind of paintings created an illusion of real space, real surface, real figures, real forms, even real life and shape. The paintings and sculptures in the tradition created an illusion of the real in modern art. Nobody would ever try to create an illusion of the real. They would rather try, as I have mentioned in my earlier module, they would rather try to interpret the real. So illusion of real space, perspective, chiaroscuro, and narrative context. This is very important. A large chunk of what is known as pre-modern art has as content, as subject matter, narrative elements. They tell you stories, and quite explicitly. In modern art, they don't tell you stories. There might be stories embedded in the subject matters, but Modern artists have never used art as a storytelling device. And there are many examples from modern Western art where the whole idea of image is non-narrative, beyond storytelling. And we would see that kind of paintings or sculptures when we talk about abstract art later. So, narrative contents, perspective, illusion of real space, here is Kuro, these were the main characteristics of pre-modern art, and a strong tradition thus developed to preserve these techniques. So you see, modern art had to face, and modern artists had to face naturally, the presence of a very, very strong tradition, which uh, kind of flourished over a period of 400, 500 years. So, as I have told you, these aesthetic foundations would be severely questioned, challenged, and upturned by the new aesthetic formulations in modern art by the modern artists. Now, since 16th century, until the emergence of modern art in the mid 19th century, the Western art tradition, generally speaking, was steeped in a realistic, illusionistic mode of representation. Right? And if we try to identify the, 
the areas where they focused on the tradition in general, irrespective of the subject matters, the main task was thus on a realistic rendering of forms, b illusionistic effect of space, c tactile sensation, and d photographic impression of light and sound. Well, uh, we are using the term photography here, but in the context of 16th, 17th, 18th century, it is completely anachronic to use the term photography because the idea of photography did not exist at all at that point of time. So when we say photographic impression of light and sound, today we are using this term from the experience that we have had of looking at the photographs or taking photographs. But for the tradition or for the artists who worked within that tradition, for them it was not photography. They did not have the idea of photography at all. For them it was realistic. It was painting. That's how a painting should look like. It should be able to recapture the reality in the language of art. That should be the objective of any art for that matter, painting or sculpture. So, this was a very, very strong base, foundation for the entire traditional art since the Renaissance period in the West until the emergence of modern art. So, to put it simply, the visual representation was based on factual observation. Factual observation is something that all visual artists do, no matter what. Whether he is an abstract painter, or realistic painter, a conceptual artist, no matter what, everybody observes. But it does not necessarily mean, as far as the modern art is concerned, that you have to replicate your observation into your art. So this is what traditional modern art, uh, the traditional Western artists would do. They would observe to replicate their observations in their art. So factual observation along with scientific study and a realistic skill. Now realistic skill is something that is not given. It needs to be achieved. And all the traditional artists in the West, they achieve this skill to an extent that their works, even today, despite the presence of photography in our culture for the last more than 150 years, even today, many of these fantastic, realistic paintings from the Western traditional art, they look incredibly convincing. They can create illusion to the extent that you feel like touching the drapery of the cloth painted on the canvas, almost forgetting that it is actually a canvas, not a cloth. And we uh, get equally amazed even today. This is because of the skill that these artists achieved. So preoccupation with realistic detailing was a major characteristic feature of this tradition, as you can see in these images. And for that matter, somebody like Leonardo da Vinci from the Renaissance period would go to the extent of doing some drawings, studies, anatomical studies, not like an artist, but almost like a scientist. And he did that. So Leonardo da Vinci, like many other Renaissance artists, was considered not only as an artist, but as an artist scientist because their approach to art was tied up, integrally tied up with their approach to science. Science and art was no, science and art was not demarcated in a very strong way. They overlapped and they exchanged ideas and in one person like Leonardo, both these characteristics, both these persona could exist. Or look at this drawing of a lion 
by the famous Dutch painter called Rembrandt. I mean, it is a sketch, not a detailed drawing. But even a quick sketch like this reveals that Rembrandt was a keen observer of the reality. A. And B. He did have that skill. He did have that ability to copy his observation to the extent that anatomically, in terms of proportion, in terms of the appearance, look, in terms of the surface, surface quality, and everything, the lion looks very realistic, very convincing. Though it is a drawing, not a problem. Same applies to the sculptures in the traditional Western art, in terms of proportion, anatomical accuracy, in terms of the surface detailing, surface treatment, their entire approach to recreate reality. Hence, realism was the dominant feature in the history of pre-modern painting as well as pre-modern sculpture. So, as you keep looking at these examples, whether it is from Renaissance or early Renaissance or later, one second, irrespective of the subject matter, the language of art, the entire tradition chose to depict the subject matters was realistic, was illusionistic. To the extent, as you can see in this work, the medium here, for example, marble, loses or it tends to lose its quality of stone and it becomes, as it were, like a cloth. That this is the skill I am talking about. The sculptors did have the skill to turn a cloth or stone into a cloth. The stone now looks like a cloth. The stone looks like the skin of a body. The stone doesn't look like stone anymore. So transforming the medium of stone into a kind of surface that is going to evoke this illusion, that is supposed to kind of give you this sense of reality, was the main objective for these artists. And later, of course, in the modern art, which has just the opposite, where the artist would love to retain the characteristic features of the stone, would love to maintain the quality of the stone, no matter what the subject matter is. So similar kind of approach to the medium, material, can be seen in most of the traditional sculptures and the paintings where the medium, whether it is stone or oil paint or watercolor or brush or ink, is simply a tool to convert an image into a reality in appearance. Of course, in reality, they could never be converted. A stone ultimately remains a stone. The oil ultimately remains an oil paint. But it should be painted, it should be sculpted in a way that they appear to be very realistic. They appear to be very real. And this is what my message is all about. And that is what exactly I was trying to say, that my mythic art dominated the entire European tradition from late 15th and early 16th century onwards until the emergence of modern Western art. Now look at this sculpture called David, very famous sculpture by Michelangelo. Again, in spite of the fact that it is made in stone, though stone is a very, very different material, uh, though it is very soft, but the way you sculpt this sculpture can turn the stone into a form that comes very close to the feel of the flesh. But the stone never becomes flesh. The stone remains a stone. 
It is an illusion of flesh that these artists have tried to produce. So the subject matters of the artworks of pre-modern phase, of course, vary. There is a diversity. And there are certain themes, there are certain themes which were more dominant than others. Now let us identify those themes and subject matters which dominated the pre-modern traditional Western art. Number one, of course, is the religious subject matters. Secondly, mythological themes. Thirdly, historical topics, which are also known as history paintings. Four, legends from the past. Five, lighted portraits of the rich people who commissioned art. You get to see an enormous a number of paintings, portraits, or the entire figures seated on the chair, things like that, which are like commissioned paintings or sculptures commissioned by the rich people. And hence you get this subject matter and a lot of artworks based on this subject matter. These are available from the Western traditional art. Number six, interior scenes or domestic scenes. There is, uh, I mean, it is a very preferred subject matter, it seems. Partly commission, partly a preference that comes from the artists. Then, of course, landscape, scenic beauty of nature, seems to be a very favorite subject for many artists. And finally, last but not the least, still life, realistic representation of objects like fruits, glass, bottles, plates, cable, anything. Now, a few examples from each of these categories, Christian and religious themes. And as you might be knowing already, there's a whole body of artworks from the Western traditional art which thrive on these themes, Christian themes and religious themes. And there could be slight stylistic differences, but the main focus is on realism. No matter what the subject matter is, the focus is on realism from late 15th and early 16th century onwards. Mythological things. Of course it is connected to Christianity, but then it has a mythological bearing because it talks about the creation of mankind, but done very realistically, so that it appears very real. Though it is mythology, which resides in our imagination, but it is portrayed or depicted very realistically, as if it did happen in real life. Then, of course, historical paintings, for example, this painting, this image of Socrates having the poison hemlock, and each and every person has been depicted with the light and shade. And look at the cloth, look at the perspective, space, with great detailing. And that is why today, who are I mean, the people like us who are accustomed with the culture of photography, we cannot. But it's very difficult to avoid the uh, whole idea of photography when we look at paintings like this. So, in spite of the anachronism I was talking about, we get tempted to use, wow, what a photographically correct and reliable painting this one is. So, there are a number of paintings in the Western tradition where history or historical event or historical moment has been reconstructed, right? like this one, the School of Athens by Raphael. Then, almost similar to mythology, there are paintings which deal with the legends from the past. But then again, done in a very realistic manner. Yes, this is one example of a painting that belongs to the category of life and portraits of rich people. Plenty of such paintings are available. 
So it is an entire category of paintings, and these are all, with all probability, commissioned artworks. Artists were commissioned to do these paintings for the rich, aristocratic people of the society. And the artists had to paint these people in a way the sitters wanted them to be painted. So, not only that the painting was commissioned, the idea was commissioned, even the subject matter, the composition, often got dictated by the person who is commissioning this painting. Now, this is the way the artists actually earned their money. This was a part of their living. And this tradition, this culture, kind of compelled the artists to achieve this realistic skill so that they could use this skill to earn their bread and butter. And we also have beautiful paintings from this category of interior and domestic scenes. But here, this impeccable application of perspective, realistic details, light and shade, sense of volume, the tactile quality of cloth, wall and different objects make these paintings look very not only realistic, they also make this painting very believable, very convincing. They don't look like that there is any imagination in this painting. But contrary to this idea, even in a realist painting, it is possible for the artist to add his or her own imagination. But because the style is so realistic, that it never becomes very conspicuous or obvious. Everything seems to be derived from what the artist has observed in the real life, in his immediate setting. And of course, lastly, and the second last category was scenic beauty of nature. This is something that artists excelled in to a great extent. Like this also. And still life. We have a very strong tradition of painting still lives in the Western art tradition. Once again, it's a peculiar category where even though still life paintings sometimes look like random compositions, they're not so random, everything is pretty arranged, but the painters, through their realistic skill, could make the paintings look very random, abrupt, arbitrary, though it is not. But all said and done, the realistic skill involved in the depiction of the subject matters made the paintings look so real that one almost gets tempted to touch the lobster or smell the fruits or pour the liquid from the vase. Yes, it is that kind of realism we are talking about. The pre-modern phase almost comes to an end when a mid-19th century British painter called Turner refused to follow the classical style of the tradition and invented his own technique and vision of landscape. As you can see here, Turner paints a certain landscape in a way which was never painted before. It is very unclassical, very non-traditional in every sense of the word. In our uh, fourth module this week, we'll be talking about Turner's paintings in great detail. And then we will discuss why this painting is a strong departure from the traditional landscape paintings. And later, in early 20th century, one of the most famous artists called Pablo Picasso would put the last nail on the coffin of the classical art by doing a painting where figures seem to be distorted beyond recognition. Yes. Even Turner's paintings 
they're almost verging on uh, the thresholds uh, from where recognition would get very difficult. But here, in this painting by Picasso, recognition may not be at stake. But what is at stake is realism. Because this is not how real women, real figures, real human beings look in real life. And this is what exactly Picasso does and proposes a new idea called Cubism. So, in the next uh, module, we will be looking at more sequentially, in, a, in an ordered manner, the timeline, the chronology of modern art, which leaves the traditional Western art behind once and for all and embarks on an entirely new journey of art. <laughs>